Chapter 7 Once again, the hallways are alive. Inmates off to work, the education department, chapel, and the yard. I find myself walking through a metal detector that is unplugged. The machine is here to serve a purpose, prevent prisoners from going to the yard with knives or weapons. It quickly becomes clear that the metal detectors are no more than decoration, ornaments dangling from a Christmas tree. There is no correctional officer present to man the machine, even if it were plugged in. The only purpose these things seem to serve is that when important people show up for an inspection, they look good. When I step out of the building, the sun hits my skin for the first time in a long time. My skin glistens, and I inhale the fresh mountain air. The air teeters on the edge of my nose and tickles my lungs. The warm sun and the fresh air feel good and trigger my thoughts. My last day as a free man bangs about in my subconscious mind. I think of it as if it were just yesterday, although it has been years. This is the closest I have been to freedom in five years. The thoughts sting, awakening a pain deep inside my heart. The county jails that I have been living in have no outside yard. There was no sun to see or fresh air to breathe, nor any wind to feel. I begin to reflect on my life as I walk through the gauntlet of fences, gun towers, and razor wire. What has my life become? I ask myself as I scan the yard. The yard is not one big yard. Rather, it is one big field separated into four areas. Each section is separated by fences, gates, and locks. The tops of the fences are adorned with spirals of gleaming razor ribbon. The main yard has a quarter-mile track with a makeshift football field that also doubles as a soccer field in the middle. Benches and tables are scattered around the yard. They all belong to different groups, gangs, and cars. This makes finding a place to sit down and enjoy the weather difficult. I survey the rest of the yard. There is a small portion where two walls sit on a concrete slab. This is where the inmates play handball. Further down is a volleyball court sitting in its own sand pit. To the right are two horseshoe pits. There is another large area that contains a neatly tailored baseball diamond. I feel the wind again as it whips across the fresh-cut grass, the sun dazzling off the blades. Now I know why Kentucky is called the Bluegrass State. A bluish tint dances on the grass as my mind takes me back home. While I gaze at the diamond, I am back in middle school playing second base, waiting for the batter to swing at the ball. I snap myself back to my reality. This is not the place for daydreams. The last yard is behind me. It is made up of basketball courts, tables on the sides. I focus on one area of tables. There is a table with a white sheet tied on top of it. It flaps slightly in the breeze. A precision blackjack replica has been drawn on the sheet. The other sheets are similarly decked out. Hand-drawn carbon copies of poker tables. This looks like they were stripped off a Las Vegas gambling table at Mandalay Bay, but in reality, they are simply prison-made gambling paraphernalia. My moment of peace was broken by a black inmate who introduces himself as Hustle Man. He has a display, different items for sale. There are sneakers, boots, clothes, magazines, artwork, homemade cars that look better than Hallmark, and food items. The crown of this little flea market stand is the sneakers. He strategically placed one sneaker on top of the boxes with the other inside. You new here, ain't you? Hustle Man asks. Just got here yesterday. Where are you from? New York, upstate, Rochester. Oh yeah? I'm from Brooklyn, and there are a bunch of homies from New York on this yard. Might be two or three from Rochester. You running with the white boys, though? Yeah, man, you know how that goes. Shit, that don't mean you can't spend no money with the Hustle Man, though. I got everything for sale. What you need, man? I'm good. I just went to commissary. Hold up, Rochester. I got something the commissary ain't got. I got the ladies, my friend. He rifles through a bag and pulls out a stack of over 200 photos. He hands me the stack of photos. I shuffle through them, all attractive women. Some are naked. Others have very little clothing on. I told you, Rochester. I got what the commissary ain't have. He says this with a sly smile. His entrepreneurship skills are on full display. I am reminded of the hustlers in Manhattan with three-card molly and the ball and cup game. This guy strikes me as the guy that runs hustles in New York City when he's not in prison. Hustle Man has me with the photos. It's been a long time since I've seen a naked woman, even if she's only in a photo. How much for the photos, I ask? Naked ladies go for eight stamps. The other sexy things go for four. I got a deal for you because you're from Rochester. Two naked, two sexy, one book. I look at Hustle Man as if he's speaking a language I do not know, and he senses this. Ain't no one told you how the money work round here, huh? Nah, not really, man. Boy, you green as a motherfucker, ain't you? Look here. Money around here is stamps. Postage stamps. 
Every stamp equals 25 cents. At this, he pulls some stamps out of his pocket to show me. Some of them are very old. Others look new. You got to have spending money on you, Rochester. You wasn't running around broke out there, was you? Nah, I wasn't broke. Okay, how much time you got? Forty years. Holy shit, was you killing people or making money, he laughs. I respond with the usual. Crack case. Man, them white folks ain't playing up there in Rochester. Anyway, with that kind of time, you're going to have to find you a hustle. It takes money to make money. I hand Hustle Man back his stack of photos and tell him I will get back to him when I get some stamps. Hustle Man hollers at me when I'm about ten feet away. Rochester, don't be coming back window shopping my ladies without no money in your pocket. I don't play about my ladies. He says this with a chuckle as I try to distance myself from him. I can't help but laugh to myself as I walk around the track. I haven't seen any violence yet. And this place reminds me of a flea market. People are selling all kinds of things. Tootsie Pops, sodas, deep-fried burritos that they call chimichangas. The changas are stuffed with meat, cheese, onions, peppers, and ramen noodles. Fresh mountain air fills my lungs, and the sun beats on my face. Things that I, like so many, took for granted are now forever precious. In and out. Out and in. I find myself satisfying my lungs with gulps of the fresh air. Prison makes me realize how valuable freedom truly is. The sun seems contaminated by the characters I see in the yard. Some of these men look like they walk straight out of a horror flick. Many of the white inmates are covered in tattoos. Some of them have their faces painted with ink. It's hard to understand why anyone would do this to their face. And now I understand what the lieutenant meant when he told me not to get tattoos on my face. His advice was appreciated, but not needed. Never in ten lifetimes would I do such a thing. A white inmate introduces himself to me as half-dead. The shock on my face must have been evident. The name half-dead is because I'm half-dead. Life sentence, bro. Half-dead comes across as a guy who fears no one and nothing. There's a tattoo across his forehead that reads, White Pride. The rest of his head, neck, and body are tattooed in neo-Nazi sayings. A portrait of Adolf Hitler covers his right side, along with the numbers 14 and 88. I ask half-dead, what's the 14 mean? It stands for the 14 most important words to the white race, he tells me. We must secure the existence of our race and a future for white children, he says. How about the 88, I ask curious. The 88 stands for 88 precepts or ideas for conscious living of the white man. My first thought is Half Dead would have fit in many years ago with the Nazi party back in Germany in 1933. He likely would have been a good SS soldier under Heinrich Himmler or some other crazed Nazi. My second thought is, this is one of the guys Kelly warned me to stay away from. The numbers 14 and 88 are products of a man named David Lang. Half Dead decides to give me a white history lesson. I listen out of curiosity. I gather from his lecture that Mr. Lang's objective in life was to rob enough armored trucks and banks to fund the purchasing of a substantial amount of land in the northwestern United States. Once the land was purchased, he planned on it becoming a new homeland for the white race. Lang had Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany ambitions. In the end, though, he only succeeded in becoming a federal prisoner and dying in a cell. From what I gather, David Lang has a lot of influence with the white prison gang members. Most of them have a 14 and an 88 tattooed on their bodies. More white inmates are now flocking to the yard, and as the new white guy, everyone wants to meet you. A skinny white guy with long hair walks up to me and half dead. The man tells me his name is Dinky, and that he is the shot caller or leader for the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas gang. It is hard for me to imagine this guy as anyone's leader. He looks like a drug addict to me. I keep my thoughts to myself as he asks me questions. He wants to know if any ABT gang members came with me. I tell him I'm not sure. Our conversation is interrupted when a black inmate starts screaming at the top of his lungs while he runs in a circle on the football field. My eyebrows arch up as I zero in on him. You know who I am? Soldier boy. Any of you fuckers want to get down? Let's go. I'll do it to your mama and your heroin-ass daddy. What the hell is the matter with that dude? I ask bewildered. Both Dinky and Half Dead start laughing. Dinky says, that dude is a bug out. A what? He's a bug out. A mental health patient, Half Dead interrupts. We call him Soldier Boy. Dude does this shit all day long, bro. Every day, screaming crazy shit. I see Soldier Boy hitting himself in the head with the palm of his hand. Is he really crazy, I ask? Yeah, something ain't right with that nigger, Dinky says, shaking his head. Half Dead laughs again. It's apparent to me, after only a few minutes of observing Soldier Boy, that he is mentally ill. It does not take long after that for me to realize that a large portion of inmates are mentally ill. The county jails were flooded with them. Some of their symptoms range from the fairly mild 
talking to oneself, failing to bathe, to more severe, men who don't know who they are or where they're at, some who light their own cells on fire, men that are so hurt that they slash their wrists or attempt to hang themselves from cell bars and fixtures. Stress has a way of worsening almost any condition, and prison is incredibly stressful. Many men have broken down for the first time in their lives when they reach prison. Not only does prison make mentally ill people worse, it also has a way of driving people crazy. In Big Sandy, I am sure I will encounter many more men on the brink of being crazy, and others like Soldier Boy, who is already there. The homeboys who sent the message to come outside never showed up. I say my goodbyes to Dinky and Half Dead, and I work my way back to the housing unit. It is nearing four o'clock. Each day at four, we are locked back into our cells for a head count to make sure we are not only still confined in this concrete jungle, but still alive. Once back in the unit, Mr. Young tells me that my homeboy said to come outside after dinner. They've been sidetracked earlier in the day. My afternoon in the yard flew by. The small sense of freedom penetrated my inner soul like a hunter's sharp arrow, piercing a deer in the wild. For the first time in many years, I was able to walk around unchained. Here, there are no cuffs on my hands, no shackles biting into my ankles. The feeling of being a chained dog has dissipated to some degree. I rejoice in this new feeling, but the pain still remains. As I look around the cell, I realize this is my new life. The reality of prison hits me like a ton of bricks. This new life reserved behind concrete walls is steel, anger, violence, and most of all, loneliness. Before long, I find myself back on the yard. The atmosphere has changed dramatically since this afternoon. Hundreds of men of all ages and races are milling around the yard. My instincts and my senses are heightened. The possibilities of bad things happening out here are evident. Instantly, I can feel tension. The fresh air that I enjoyed earlier is now contaminated by a pressure that seems to be lurking on the horizon. In the distance, I see a man about six foot one, 250 pounds with long black hair beelining in my direction. Within seconds, he is upon me. As his outstretched hand meets my own, he introduces himself. Adam, you must be Chad. Yeah, Chad, how are you? Good, he responds. You need anything? No, man, I'm all set. Well, we knew a white dude from New York was coming. We saw your name on the bus list with an 055 number, so we were waiting on you, Adam says as he clears his throat. Yeah, well, some people told me you wanted to meet me. They kind of gave me the rundown in this place, I say. Is this your first spot, Adam asks? Yeah, first federal prison. Do you know about paperwork? Did anyone tell you about that? Just a little bit in the county jail. I kind of heard you got to get your transcripts or something, I say. Well, what we do is give you 30 days to get your docket sheet, sentencing transcript, and judgment of commitment, just to make sure you're not a chomo. A what, I respond? A chomo, man. Child molester, or a rat, or snitch. That type of shit. Nah, man, I'm no chomo. And I went to trial and got 40 years. Yeah, we had one of the cops check you out already, but that's just general info on their computers. We just need you to get that paperwork. It's your driver's license around here, Adam goes on. I'll write my lawyer or the court and get it for you, I say. Come on, let's spin the yard so I can introduce you to some of the fellas from New York and Boston, Adam says, and we head to the track. The track is similar to the one from my high school days. While we walk, I notice the sun bouncing off the asphalt, making it look like small diamonds are embedded and glistening there. Adam is waving to a group of four or five guys, summoning them. One of the guys that Adam introduces me to is a stone-cold drunk. He reeks of booze. Being drunk in here has to be like a freight train on a collision course. As I reach out to shake the drunkard's hand, I hear a guy behind us tell Adam that the Serenors are going to hit one of their guys. They hit and creep her he says, and he nods towards the bathroom. My gaze goes from the drunkard to the bathroom area where I can see a bunch of Hispanics milling around one man, who I suppose is Creeper. We all focus our attention on the bathroom area. We see the first punch, a sucker punch, meet its target. It comes from a man about six foot one who towers over his prey by at least a foot. The victim stumbles back and his long black hair tumbles and waves from the impact. Creeper begins to swing wildly, but two more inmates pounce on him like wolves on a small buffalo. Within seconds, Creeper falls to the ground like a limp log felled at the hand of a chainsaw operator. I am stunned, looking on. Two more Mexican inmates move in, and they commence to stabbing their mark with homemade plastic knives. A siren blares over our heads when the first gunshot rings out, startling me. The shotgun blast, a warning shot, echoes through my ears like thunder pounding the side of a mountain in a desolate storm. Creeper seems to be unconscious, but the assault continues. The onslaught of violence reminds me of seeing two pit bulls attacking a person on the TV show when animals attack. These men, too, are animals. 
Another gunshot rings out, followed by a concussion grenade fired from the gun tower that is only feet away from the melee. There is a mass confusion now. Prisoners are attempting to flee the area before live rounds are fired. The PA system rings out with instructions. All inmates get on the ground. Shots will be fired. The PA squawks again, in Spanish this time. It sounds like Cuesta Se, Cuesta Se Matusos. At least that is what my brain registers as I throw myself to the ground. Looking up from my prone position, I see correctional officers and other staff members running toward the scuffle. More gunshots and the loud siren pierce the air like a broken record, repeating the get on the ground instructions in both English and Spanish. Laying in the dirt, I wish I had a battle helmet on. Adam interrupts my thoughts. Yo, Chad. Welcome to Vietnam, my friend. Shit gets real around here. You have to get used to it, bro. It happens all the time around here, kid. This shit is crazy, I call back. Yeah, but it's always exciting and it passes the time, he says. If this is how they pass time around here, I think to myself, I am sure to see a lot of despair. I can only pray that I'm not on the receiving end of passing time. After running into harm's way, the officers have quelled the assault. Creeper seems to be awake, but distraught. Blood flows from his face and his dirty white t-shirt is adorned with red circles, where his skin was punctured by the makeshift prison shanks. Those who committed the assault are handcuffed and escorted off the yard. Creeper is not cuffed, but he is led off the recreation yard by an officer who holds Creeper's hands behind his back. My mind dances with the thoughts while Adam talks to me. I hear him, but whatever he is saying does not register. My stomach seems to be twisting and turning like a whirlpool, as I realize that the thought of being shot did not deter these men from continuing their assault. The thought of being shot had no bearing on these deranged men. I cry out silently to God for help. Where am I? Please help me, God. Before long, a voice on the loudspeaker orders us to stand up and to leave the yard when our housing unit is called. The recreation yard is officially closed for the evening, earlier than usual. No complaints from me. As I make my way off the yard, I am sad. I think about how I would rather not smell fresh air, or have the wind beat against my back, or the rays of sun to beat on my face, if it comes at the expense of watching someone be stabbed and brutalized while bullets whiz through the air. On the way back to the housing unit, Adam tells me that he needs to talk to me some more in the morning. He also mentions that it is something important and that he wants to introduce me to a guy named Dennis from Boston. We say our goodbyes with handshakes. Paying heed to the wearing shoes to the shower instructions, I gather my hygiene products into a heap and beeline to the shower. I'm concentrating on Adam's words, that he has to talk to me about something important. What could be important? The word important sets my mind to juggling, worrying a little bit. Perhaps it is the extreme violence I witness that has me on edge. Only time will tell. Chapter 8 The morning comes early after a night of little rest. Different thoughts race through my mind like an out-of-control Amtrak train. That made sleep hard to come by. The assault on Creeper and Adam's mention of having to talk to me about something important left me in a state of disarray. I wish that the Federal Bureau of Prisons would have sent me somewhere other than this magic mountain. Kelly is the first person I see when I exit my cell. As has been the custom, we make our way to the mess hall together. Kelly tells me he is moving to another housing unit where some of his homeboys from his state are housed. The surprise and disappointment must be obvious on my face, as it prompts Kelly to delve into one of his Prison 101 instructional talks. We stop mid-stride. Look here, honky, he says with a serious face. You got a 40-piece. I ain't going to be here much longer anyway. You're going to figure this shit out. You got no other choice, Chad. I just wish you weren't moving, though, for real, I say. You're cool. You've been hanging out with Nick anyway. He's your homeboy. If you need me, bro, I ain't that far from you. I'll see you on the yard every day, kid. You're supposed to meet Adam and your homeboys today anyway, right? Yeah, I think so, I respond. What the hell do you mean you think so, Kelly said. Yeah, I'm meeting them today, I respond in a gloomy voice. Come on now, Chad. Don't act like your fucking dog just died. Crackers crumble, honkies rumble. You're a goddamn honky with 40 years. That little kid's sad shit ain't going to get it in here. It's man up time, my boy. So what's up? You gonna be all right, right? Man, I'm gonna be all right, I say with false confidence in my voice. Kelly reaches his hand out to shake mine and we continue to the mess hall. In a sense, Kelly was like a security blanket for me or a big brother in a place where very few people extend a hand to help with good intentions. Now, after just a few days, that blanket is being ripped from under me. Eating breakfast is almost as difficult as sleeping was. We eat in silence while my nerves do somersaults. My stomach is uneasy. I shovel the food down, tasting nothing. My focus is on Kelly moving, and me having to find my own way here at Big Sandy. 
Not knowing what the future has in store for me in this forsaken place rattles me. This is my journey. When I made a choice to sell drugs, I chose my path, and with it, my destination. Whatever is going to happen here, I think to myself, is going to happen. Prison can be a frightful place. Adjusting takes time. Eventually, most people do. If you don't adjust, you perish. My prison thoughts are halted when I see Adam in the distance coming through the kitchen doors. He's not alone. A small Irish kid, heavily tattooed with four-leaf clovers, accompanies him as they approach me with Adam's outstretched hand. Chad, this is Dennis, the homeboy from Boston that I was telling you about. We shake hands as Dennis chimes in. We were waiting on you. Knew you was coming. What are you doing after breakfast? His Boston accent is unmistakable. Nothing. Why? What's up? Come out to the yard so I can holler at you, bro, Dennis says with a smile. All right, I answer, playing things cool. I take everything in little by little. My first impression of Dennis is that he is a tough, confident kind of kid about the same age as me. Dennis tells me to wait until they get done eating and we will all shoot out to the yard together. It's better to be together around here, he says with a sly smile. Once Dennis and Adam finish eating, we walk to the yard. The fresh air seeps into my lungs. Birds chirp in the distance. The sun is warm. Peace blankets the yard. The battlefield from last night is no more, and I welcome the calmness. All three of us set out toward the track. Dennis initiates conversation. As Adam looks on, Dennis tells me that in federal prison, they have what the prisoners and staff call cars. A car is a group of men from a certain area. Dennis's car consists of white guys from the East Coast, mostly from Massachusetts and New York. He is adamant that the car is not a gang, but a group of men from the same area who have things in common and who watch each other's backs. He goes on further. The white gang members at Big Sandy are oppressive and try to take advantage of white inmates who are on their own. Taking advantage of white inmates who are on their own grabs my attention. Right now, I am on my own. Curiosity coupled with the fear of being taken advantage of prompts me to ask for details. What are the gang dudes doing? I ask in my pretend nonchalant voice. In reality, I don't want anyone to know I am worried about being on my own and equally worried about these white gang members trying to turn me into a Big Sandy victim. All kinds of bullshit, Adam replies. The douchebags are cutting knives out of dudes' beds, Dennis says, extorting good white dudes to feed their drug habits, stealing, and one dude was trying to rape a younger white dude. He ended up getting smashed the day you came in. We had a couple dudes punish him. He left on a stretcher. I saw that guy leave on the stretcher, but I don't share that with Dennis or Adam. It's Adam's turn to speak. We just came from bloody Beaumont, bro, down in Texas. And what we ain't going for are our people getting taken advantage of. We are putting our own thing together, bro. And being you're from the Big Apple like me, this is your car. Us. It's our car. This is your home. It's where you belong. You got a lot of time, bro, and this is the wrong place to be alone. Adam says all this in a stern, almost urgent voice. I am already convinced I know exactly what I'm going to do, even if I don't share it with either of them yet. Being alone or on my own, behind these walls is not an option. If there is a sign-up sheet, I sure wish they would give it to me. The dotted line is surely calling my name. In my old life, I was a tough guy, but this place is filled with a lot of guys tougher than me. In my heart, I know I can hold my own one-on-one. -on -one. Big Sandy is not a one-on-one -on -one type of place. The best choice for me is with my homeboys. At least that's what I think for the moment, for the here and now. These gang dudes are like vultures, Dennis adds. When we first got here, we almost went to war with the ABTs, the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, but they didn't really want it, Adam says, excitement in his voice. You see that dude over there? That's Dinky, their lame-ass shot caller. He's a real dirtball piece of white shit. I look off to my right in the direction Adam is pointing in. Standing there is a scraggly-looking white prisoner. He is the same guy I met the day before who initially rubbed me wrong. Dinky was scared to death. He knows we would have butchered him and his whole car. We had a hundred white dudes out here with vests on and bone crushers. It would have looked like the St. Valentine's Day Massacre or the Attica prison riots out here. He wanted to politic it out. He wanted to talk things out, Dennis tells me. I interrupt with what I can tell seems like a silly question to him. Listen, man, I am new, so I don't know a lot. What the hell is a bone crusher and a vest? Dennis laughs. Yeah, bro, you're green as fuck, and you got a lot to learn. A bone crusher crushes bones. You have to come to the unit later, and I'll show you what it is. We make vests out of the long sleeve shirts. We got guys that sew big pockets in them in the vital areas. Once the pockets are in, we put magazines and books in the pockets. If you get stabbed in that area, it protects your ass from dying in here. Damn, man. This is a crazy place is my response. 
My mind somersaults as each new piece of violence, or the potential for it, passes my ears. My mind races as I realize more and more how serious USP Big Sandy really is. I try to play things off so both Adam and Dennis don't realize how nervous I really am about this place. For a moment, I am back in front of the mirror that morning I left Youngstown, Ohio. Once again, I am unsure if I'm going to be okay. I do not think there is much of a choice for me. It's either be in this car or be here on my own, and being on my own does not seem feasible in this environment. The way Adam and Dennis laid things out reinforces my sudden desire to be a part of a car. It is clear to me that I am being recruited to be a part of this gang that these two guys have convinced themselves is not a gang. They simply switched the name from gang to car. Within days of being in prison, I am doing exactly what I had promised myself I would never do, join a gang. I reasoned within myself that I made that promise before I knew what prison was really like. Both Mr. Young and Kelly warned me not to do this, but they must be wrong. They have to be wrong. I tell myself. If people who are on their own are being raped, having their stuff stolen, and having white racist gang members cut knives out of their beds, why would I, or anyone, choose to be on their own in here? Chad, you're a homeboy no matter what. You're from New York. All we got in here is each other. You know we are going to have to check your paperwork to make sure you're a good dude. Once we check that, you can get your driver's license. No offense to you, it's just how it is, Adam says with a sly smile. Do you got your docket sheet and sentencing transcript, Dennis asks? I got that stuff in my property and my PSR. You got your PSR in there? Dennis asked, surprised. Yeah, I got it, I said. They don't let us have them no more. Hopefully you got it hidden in there and they give it to you, bro, Dennis said. As soon as I get my property, I will make sure I get those papers to you, I say sternly. I feel myself getting a little more confident. Adam interrupts my confidence. Yeah, once we check that out, you get your license if everything checks out. And I got a knife for you. My newfound confidence disappears when he mentions the knife. I really don't want to be carrying a knife, and more than that, I don't want either Adam or Dennis to know. I keep this fact to myself. I can see I will need to keep many other things to myself. Tonight after chow, you have to come to our unit. Come over to meet the homies, check out the vests, and our arsenal. Dennis says this with bravado in his voice. Looking for an excuse to not have to go to his unit, I ask? How the hell am I going to get to your unit with the cop in there? The cop doesn't care who comes into the unit, bro. He's doing his eight and going home, Dennis snickers. That bitch Atkins ain't working our unit tonight, Adam asks. Nah, bro. He's the two-day relief, Dennis says. Yeah, you're good, Chad. We'll see you after dinner, bro, Adam says. As I walk to my unit, I find myself shaking my head. I can't believe I made the irrational and irresponsible decisions that brought me to Big Sandy to meet Adam and Dennis. Tonight, dinner brings with it my introduction to vests and sharpened metal for dessert. Chapter 9. Dennis takes me into his cell. I feel a burst of adrenaline entering my veins ignited by the unknown. He opens his locker, then he removes a false shelf that reveals his small cache of prison weapons. Dennis first shows me a menacing piece of steel, about 9 or 10 inches long. I can see that the metal is from one of the beds, and I wonder if Dennis cut it from a bed belonging to one of the white guys who were on their own. Scanning his bunk, I can see no metal is missing from his bed. He hands me the shank. I inspect it. I am swollen with curiosity. Both sides are sharpened and meet at a threatening point that looks as if it can actually pierce a person's bones. I can tell my fascination that something this dangerous can be fabricated in a prison cell shows on my face when Dennis says, I told you, bro, we got bone crushers in here. I flip the makeshift weapon in my hand as I continue my examination. One end of this pointed dagger is wrapped in black electrical tape for better grip. There's a string tied in a small circle so it can be wrapped around the stabber's wrist. With the lanyard hooked around the combatant's wrist, there is slim chance a prison warrior will lose this weapon during the fight. Holding the shank in my hand, I cannot begin to fathom how it would feel to be on the receiving end of a stabbing by such a brutal weapon. There is no doubt that in the hands of a deranged prisoner, this weapon could be used to send any of the 1,500 prisoners at Big Sandy, including myself, to a tumbling, brutal death. Dennis tells me he made this knife on his own. He took the guard off a pair of beard trimmers and took a small nail clipper and used them as saws. Armed with these tools, he dug into the bed frame of another inmate's bed. After long hours of tedious sawing, he successfully separated a piece of metal from the bed frame. Once the metal was free, he spent hours sharpening the knife on a hard surface. Back and forth, over and over, until he had the killing point he wanted. I hand the knife back. Dennis smiles, showing me his stained teeth. Shit ain't no joke, is it, bro? Shit's real, I see, is my response. 
Dennis continues, a mad concierge proudly displaying the rest of the arsenal he told me about earlier. There are knives of all sizes coupled with grotesque metal bars. Some of the knives are made from plexiglass stripped from fluorescent light fixtures in the cells. Others were formed from melted plastic. Other bone crushers, smaller than the one I handled earlier, were visible. Dennis picks up a piece of steel rebar pipe that's at least a foot long and heavy. He slaps it in his palm. Suddenly he takes a swing at the corner of his locker, startling me. Paint and small speckles of metal explode in the air on impact. My heart races and my adrenaline surges. The fight-or-flight instinct kicks in. I wonder if I am safe. The panic that has just set in is broken by Dennis's laugh. Dennis says, This will break a motherfucker's head, bro. Put him out for the count. Wanting to break my uncomfortableness, I reply, Where did you get all this shit from, man? We got a dude in our car named Preston. He works in the kitchen, bro. Ripped like ten of them out of the ceiling. I am surprised that a prisoner could simply rip ten bars of steel rebar out of a ceiling and somehow get them back to a housing unit. You know, if you hit someone in the head with one of them, there is no question you're going to kill them, I say. Dennis takes me all the way back to fifth grade. Duh. That's the point. Around here, we're playing for keeps. There are no tomorrows around here, bro. If one of these douchebags is stabbing you and you get a shot off to his dome with this, he won't be stabbing you no more, would he, bro? I guess not, dude, I respond. The captain was right when he told me to get a knife. Everyone in this place has one, or some sort of weapon. I debate whether I should have one, but debating does not make sense to me. It seems like decisions in here are made for me based on the circumstances that surround me. Yeah, Chad, we never make bad decisions. In any mission we go on, we always send three or four guys. We make sure we never lose, and I'm hoping you make the right decision here. Keeping it real, bro. In this place, your next move has to be your best move. There really is no room for mistakes. Me and you are about the same age, got the same time, so for real, take my lead. All I'm saying to you is to help you so you make it around here. Yeah, Dennis, I understand. I just got to get into the groove of things around here, I said. Come on, bro, I'm going to introduce you to the big homie Stevie. He's from my neighborhood. Got a life sentence, kid. For real. He has the keys to the car. We run a tight car in here. Stevie is at the top, and Adam is like the second in command. Stevie looks to be in his mid-fifties. The man is completely bald. His body is decorated with all kinds of Celtic knotwork representing his Irish heritage. He does not look like the stereotypical prison shot caller. He's not what I imagined. When Dennis was telling me about him, I had a much different image. I thought the guy would be a big, muscle-bound, Irish-looking guy. Steve is small in stature, bald, no facial hair. He reminds me of Casper the Ghost. Like many things in prison, looks can be deceiving. Mr. Young Micelli filled me in on some of Stevie's backstory prior to this meeting. His looks do not match his history. While he does not look dangerous, his resume says he is. As it turns out, Stevie is not serving one life sentence. Stevie is serving three life sentences. In the mid-90s, he and his counterparts were in the business of robbing armored cars. One of these robberies in the Boston area resulted in the death of a guard. Mr. Young told me that it was also rumored that Stevie killed another inmate in a knife fight at United States Penitentiary Marion, Illinois. As a result of that killing, he was locked in a cage all by himself for five years. Being confined to a cell for five years all alone can only ignite one's hatred and anger. USP Marion was built in Illinois back in 1963. It was designed to replace the notorious Alcatraz prison and was designed to house the worst of the worst that the United States had. While Stevie was on that list, others much more dangerous roamed the confines of that prison. People like Thomas Silverstein, one of the leaders of the Aryan Brotherhood gang. Silverstein is by far the most famous white prisoner the Federal Bureau of Prisons has ever held. In 1981, he was accused of killing another inmate by the name of Robert Chappelle. This was done by wrapping a wire around Chappelle's neck and strangling him through the cell bars while he lay sleeping. Less than a year later, his murderous streak behind prison bars continued when he stabbed Raymond Cadillac Smith with a prison shank over 60 times, ending his life behind Marion's dark walls. Cadillac had his own stature in federal prison. He was the shot caller for the D.C. Black Gang, D.C. as in Washington, D.C., this is a group of prisoners who, to this day, are known for their unity, as well as their penchant for trouble behind the razor wire. Silverstein's thirst for violence in Marion did not end with the killing of two black inmates. Just over a year after Cadillac's murder, he struck again. This time, the person in his sights was not a convict. This time, he was a correctional officer. On a chilly October day in 1983, armed with his customary weapon of choice, Silverstein attacked Officer Merle Klutz. When the battle for life or death had ceased, Klutz was on the losing end. He died in brutal fashion after being stabbed more than 40 times. 
With three vicious murders under his belt at Marion, Silverstein's status as the worst of the worst in the federal prison system shot to the top. Few federal inmates, if any, have surpassed his status to this day. Klutz's murder would not be the only shocking thing that happened at Marion that October day. Eight hours after Silverstein struck, his good friend and fellow prisoner, Clayton Fontaine, was looking to make his own mark. Like Silverstein, he armed himself with a sharpened death instrument. This time, correctional officer Robert L. Hoffman was on the receiving end of the beastly violence that plagued the Marion prison. Like Klutz, Hoffman met his maker on that dark October day. Two guards had never been murdered on the same day in the same prison. As a result of the day's events, those in charge of the federal prison system made changes at Marion. The facility was turned into a lockdown prison. All prisoners were to be locked in their cells 23 hours a day, seven days a week. Prisoners were permitted one hour a day, five days a week out of their cells for what, almost ironically, came to be known as recreation. This is where Stevie spent five years of his life. For many, this was part of his folklore. This seemed to bring many young white convicts into his fold. Regardless of his looks, I get the feeling that Stevie's disregard for the lives of others makes him dangerous. Being able to discern who is who behind these walls is a quality I am beginning to develop. Such a quality may turn out to serve me well in here. Stevie tells me that both Adam and Dennis think I am a good guy, and that it would make him happy if I did the right thing by joining the car. I feel as if I'm on the spot. I'm in a position where I have to make a decision, and I'm not able to give it much thought. Stevie seems to have some magical, influential power or spirit. He urges me to do what he calls the right thing. Within seconds, an agreement to be a part of the car comes out of my mouth, although my senses are tugging at me, an alarm within telling me to decline the offer, at least for now. The word no cannot be found. Stevie reaches out to shake my hand, pulling me into him with a hug and coupled with a pat on the back. I am now welcomed into this East Coast prison brotherhood with hugs from Adam and Dennis. They look at me with big smiles as if they just brought another soldier into the fold. They look at Stevie as if they are looking at him for the praise a small boy seeks from his father. In time, I learn that all the guys in the car do whatever Stevie asks them to do. He has a leadership quality that most people long for, but never find. After we leave the confines of Steve's cell, Dennis explains that there is a probation period before I'm fully accepted into the car. Guys that are new to the car are the ones that are called upon to put in work or to go on what are called missions. When problems arise... Probationers are the ones expected to wreak violence on any prisoners who transgress any of the prison rules set out in the convict code. This is the part where a person's loyalty to the car is tested. Some people will kill for their car. Whether it be out of fear, loyalty, or to enhance one's prison cred is a mystery to me. But at the end of the day, this is the reality in a maximum security prison. Cars work in different ways behind these walls. Men within the cars are ordered to do things that will jeopardize them or place them in positions where they could end up with new charges. Sometimes it might be a simple assault. Other times they may be ordered to mule drugs on visits. Whatever the shot caller needs, he asks for, and any objection is considered a disrespect to the car. The end result of any refusal is an assault on the objector. Saying no is a no-win situation. If a shot caller likes a person, he might not call on that person to do his dirty work, but eventually... Everyone has to put in some work. Every car has expendables. These guys are referred to as missiles or crash test dummies. Shot callers summon them to missions under the guise that they are putting in work for the good of the car. Victims of violence are usually people who are found out to be sex offenders or those who snitched on someone at some point in their lives. Dennis explains all this to me, but assures me that because I am from New York, I am part of the upper echelon. This is when I learn there are others in the car who are not from the East Coast. Some are from the Midwest. Some are from the South. These are our missiles. According to Dennis, they're not really our homeboys. Tonight, the car is having a meeting. I am expected to be on the yard at 6 o'clock. The yard at night always leaves me with an unsettled stomach. For me, the yard is more of a gladiator pit than a place of recreation. I am not looking forward to this meeting, but then again, who really is?